would like to open now uh, the book of Proverbs, your Bible there, uh, and we will be reading from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, uh, through to the end of chapter 1. And if you are new with us, uh, we are expositing, working through the book of Proverbs at this present time. Word of God says, Proverbs 1.20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you, because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would, not, would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of distress. That is the word of the Lord. Let us now pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come now to your holy word with great reverence and deep respect. Uh, Lord, I ultimately have nothing to say apart from what you have to say. And so, Lord, I pray that I would adequately speak on your behalf through this text, that I'll make it known as it ought to be known, as you are wanting us to hear it. And I pray that the Spirit of the living God would move among us in our heart. And Lord, if anyone is outside of Christ, that they would see the very terror of being so. And Lord, I pray for all those who are in Christ, that they would take heart, that they would look to you and be at ease, fearing nothing for disaster, but be secure in Jesus. Uh, Lord, would you do your work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm sure each of you have been watching the war take place at this very moment between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in somewhat of a disbelief, we have watched Russia uh, storm Ukraine and, in a sense, uh, declare war upon her and start shelling her. And it does look at this moment that it will spiral out into a bloody warfare. I'm sure you've seen uh, things on the TV that are very, very disturbing. And we certainly need to be praying for uh, Ukraine at the moment, uh, that uh, the Lord's mercy would be there, that he would even use this uh, to draw people from himself, to himself, that he would um, use the church to spread the love and security of Christ. However, though Russia had been massing its troops on the border, border of, uh, of Ukraine and uh, Vladimir Putin had been posturing, saying that, you know, I will come and do certain things, it was amazing to me to read or to, to watch the news of those just before Russia actually advanced uh, to see the complacency of the Ukrainian people. I think in many ways they thought that he's been doing this for so long, surely he's not going to um, invade. That would be terrible. Um, though the fact that he had just basically surrounded where he could, uh, Ukraine. But I was amazed at the complacency of the people and now they are engaged in a battle uh, war and to, to death. Lewis Allen 
in his The Preacher's Catechism states that for the Christian, complacency is the devil's word. Complacency is the feeling of self-satisfaction without knowledge or awareness of the dangers or deficiencies lurking in you or outside of you. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom acts as a siren call to the complacent. Wisdom is presented here, particularly in our text, as a matter of life and death. Because having wisdom should be to listen to God with an eager heart and to fear Him. And Proverbs presents two paths. One for the wise that ends in security and ease and peace and one for the fool that ends in perishing. And there is no third path. There is no third way. Two ways to live. One in the fear of the Lord with wisdom, or one who is complacent and says no to God. The one who is wise, they understand as the Song goes, and as I think the testimonies declared, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Jesus is not just a kind of garnish to place upon your life to make it just, you know, to make it good, to make it taste better. I like scrambled eggs, and that little bit of parsley on top just finishes it off. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is the meal. He's everything. And the one who has wisdom understands that. Our passage this morning ends with a key verse here. Complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to Christ will dwell secure. As we come to this passage this morning, I want you to sense the, the feel, the, the urgency of God's call upon our life. The wicked had been boastful uh, in the early parts of chapter 1, saying that come with us, we will go for bloodshed, we will get the innocent and we will be fine. But here, wisdom is more than matched with the formidable voice that is recorded here in terrifying condemnation of fools. A condemnation which speaks of terror and calamity akin to the judgments declared by the prophets of old. We must understand, beloved and friend, that complacency toward Christ is a deadly enemy. And only an acute desire for him will result in the manifestation of Christ to his people, in his people, and through his people. Complacency. We want to flee as far away from it as we can. And here, wisdom speaks to us in kind of a personified lady called Lady Wisdom. And the first thing she does is she makes her call. Wisdom's call in verses 8 to 19, we've been listening to the Father speak to the Son in what is the first of ten speeches he makes. But now here, the Father directs his Son to wisdom. Now, we know, as I've said in the first message, that wisdom is the skill of living successfully under God and for God. But now, wisdom... Is not just a path, she here is presented as a lady, as a woman. And in one sense, I would see that we could overlay this with wisdom being the voice of Jesus. Wisdom, or Jesus, who was um, wisdom incarnate, is in a sense making this speech to us. And the first thing wisdom does is, or it shows, is that wisdom's call is earnest, is earnest. She comes not as a shrinking violet, as if, whoa, I won't speak, I'll just, you know, sit there like a wallflower. She comes 
with a loud voice. And it says she cries out. Look how many times in verses 20 and 21. She cries out. She raises her voice. She cries out. She speaks. She doesn't do so in the temple or in the church. You're here and in a sense you are here in the preaching of the word of God. But she doesn't just go to the religious. She like uh, Whitfield and Wesley, um, preachers from of old, they go to the people. And see, she goes out where wisdom should be used. She goes into the marketplace. She strides the streets here. She enters the market. She stands at the gates where business and commerce operate. And like the incarnate Christ who walked the length and breadth of uh, Israel, declaring the wisdom of God, it wasn't just simply cloistered in the temple, but went to the very people in their very circumstances, in the situation that they were in. And in a sense, she's calling you. Whatever you, wherever you are in life, in your business, in your family, um, in the marketplace, whatever it is, she is calling. The knowledge of God and the message of Christ is clearer than many people are winning, willing to admit. And most people know more than they like to admit. And God has been crying out since the dawn of time in so many and varied countless ways even into your life. It says in Psalm 19, 1-2, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork day by day, pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Wisdom is speaking to all of us through the created order and saying, fear God which is the beginning of wisdom. And Romans 1.20 says that by our rejection of the God of creation, we have no excuse. Everyone is bound up in that. But not only that, God has been crying out in our own heart and in our own conscience. Even though you might not have the law to say, do this or do that, you know when you do wrong, it gives you this guilty feeling in your conscience. That is the very law of God, the morality of God stamped upon your conscience to say guilty. That's God crying out, fear God. Fear God. Don't run from Him, run to Him. And then God sends Jesus Christ, who is now presented in the Word of God. And Jesus Christ, who is our wisdom, says to me, says to you, come and bear and I will bear your guilt, and I'll bear your condemnation. Receive me. God has been crying out. He has been raising his voice. No one will ever use the excuse, I never knew. God never spoke to me. I never got a word from God. God's been crying out. Wisdom has been crying out in the streets, and so has God. And in your complacency, God is calling you now to speak into your life with care and compassion and say, come, even now. The devil wants to convince you that there is no imminent danger massing on the borders of your life, that everything is okay, that the path I'm treading down is fine. I've just got to get over these little hurdles, but I'm sure it's good on the other side. God is saying, wake up, because complacency is going to kill you. And he's available and he's pressing in. But notice the call is earnest, but it's also demanding. Listen to this, verse 22. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in, your, in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Previously, um, the father was speaking to the son who, who is supposedly set among the wise. So the wise are the ones who fear God, listen to God. And now wisdom directs the speech to three groups of people, to the simple, to the scoffers, and to the foolish. And so maybe you're among them, right? And the simple, I, I expressed this in previous sermons, is ones who are gullible, sort of open-minded. Yeah, look, you know, Jesus is not bad. I like Jesus. I'm here. You know, I've come to the baptism service. Jesus is good. He's not everything, but he's fine. I, I, I like the Bible. I've got nothing against that. This is the sort of fence sitter. 
one who is self-satisfied. You know, but don't want to be too, you know, Christianized. This is, the, this is the complacent one. This is the one who says, no, no, no. I don't believe Jesus is exclusive. I'll take him with everything else, but I'm not trusting in him alone. I'll have faith in him and maybe my good works. I'll have faith in him and maybe I'll rest in my job and all my business opportunities or whatever. See, such a person who speaks like that would never accept a divided heart from their spouse. If she said, I like you, so I like John and Jim and, hey, no, that's not on. I'm the guy, I'm the one. Well, Jesus is not Jesus is not going to accept a divided heart. See, we'd never expect it from someone else, but we somehow expect it from Jesus. That's the simple one. Then there's the scoffer. It says, they scoff in their scoffing. They delight in their scoffing. You've seen this before. The scoffer sort of mocks. They actually gain a lot of self-satisfaction in mockery. I remember I went to a business meeting of a very high-profile client when I was in business. Very wealthy. And I remember sitting there and they were talking about um, how their children are now moved out and in with their girlfriends and everything. And the guy, I just remember, he just said um, something like, they used to call that sin. And just mocking the concept that there is such a thing as sin, which would mean you're going to be brought to account. And that's the sort of guy, scoffing and finding some sort of pleasure in the scoffing. But then there's the fool, and this is the thick-headed, the, the stubborn one. Don't talk to me about Christ. I, I've worked it out. I don't want anything to do with it. This is the one who hates knowledge. And the persistence of Christ is yet quite remarkable. See, the, the scoffer and the fool have basically, they've shut Jesus out. It's like, this is the point in our text. It's like, they're shut out, the simple, I'm, I'm speaking to you. There is an opening here, you're on the fence, I'm trying to convince you. There's, there's armies massing on your border, listen, listen. They are still open, and so long as they're open, wisdom will keep crying. But Christ will not cry forever. The simple must make up their mind. It says, how long is the cry? How many sermons do you need to listen to? How many dead-end roads do you need to walk down before you realize that's not the path? Before you take seriously Christ and start down the new path with him. That's what wisdom's asking. Almost in a kind of final call here, wisdom flings open the door of salvation before it is closed. She states, verse 23, If you turn at my reproof, see, if you would listen, and the word turn here really is the word repent, to look at the path you're going down and the, the, the view you have of Jesus and would turn and repent and say, wrong path, I am sorry, please forgive me for the folly I've been going and I trust in Jesus. Now in the Old Testament, to turn was to lead their gods and to show their, um, show their love for Jesus or love for God through sac the sacrificial system when they know that the sacrificial system would atone for their sins. For us on this side of the cross, it is in one sense to turn from our gods, to turn from our wayward going. We don't make sacrifices for sin. Why? These guys shared it clearly enough because Jesus became our sacrifice. And so I turn from my sin and I accept the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. And I say, Lord, please renew me. See, if we are open to others challenging our lives and not trying to protect ourselves and say, I don't want to be simple any longer, then our Lord says, Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. This is a beautiful promise. We are so weak and fragile, so given over to temptations and fears, and Jesus promises 
that if we would turn, that the power to live in a way that honours Him would be not given to us, or it would not be of ourselves, but of Him. Have you ever, as a kid, gotten this really cool toy for Christmas, only to open it, and it has no batteries? And mum says, oh, it's okay, the store's not open at the moment, but we'll get them. What's the point of the present? Just to say, when you receive Jesus Christ, batteries are included. Meaning the power to live for him is included. That's the whole point of coming to Christ. It is, I have no battery. All my batteries are just wound down. They're destroyed. I have no ability to please God. This insurmountable debt is there. It's wiped away. I turn. I receive nothing in my hand. I bring simply to the cross. I cling. And the power of Christ comes into us to live in a way that honors him. And by and by, he will point out sins and he will change us and transform us. That's the power of the resurrection of the new heart, new desires, renewed mind, new insights of the word. You look at this book, you say, man, this book is scary. I don't understand it. It seems like it's boring. He says here that I will make my words known to you. It'll come alive. The promises of God will come alive. I won't be able to stop putting it down. Just turn, turn and receive. At this point in the passage, there's kind of a pause. All right, so wisdom has just laid that out there. And it's pulled back and she's waiting for a response. Will you listen? Will you turn? Will you receive? Or will you not? I cannot express to you the urgency of this. The call here is today. Now. Not tomorrow. Delay is mockery to God. To delay and say no is mockery to God. At some point, and it may be today, the Spirit of Christ stops striving and says no. Look what happens, and this is this is wisdom's warning, verses 24. See how God calls by creation, calls by conscience, calls by the word, calls by, calls by ministers, by mums and dads and friends, but still the, simp- the, the simple remain complacent, at least in our text. I mean, Charles Bridges says, but such grace, so rich and free, yet rejected? Who can take a gauge of this guilt? Not until he calls, the calls have been refused, does he thunder forth his warning and says in verse 24, because I have called and you refuse to listen. I don't want to hear anymore. Stop. Have, I have stretched out my hand and no one is heeded because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. Notice the first rejection of wisdom will be celebration. It says that wisdom will laugh at the simple calamity. If you are too busy to go, busy for God, too consumed with your life, simple, too complacent to respond to his message, God will not apologize. Instead, he celebrates the demise of those who will not turn. Man, that sounds terrible. Is that the God? Is that I thought God was a loving God. Ezekiel says, say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. God's putting out his hand, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? See, I want you to understand what's happening here. God's heart is for you to turn. He is calling you and longing for you to turn and receive him. He's not laughing at the pain of the fools, the demise of the fools or the simple. What he's he's celebrating is he's celebrating the defeat of evil. This is the laugh of triumph of what is right against what is wrong. God will never negotiate his holiness. He loves his holiness. He is righteous And God may judge with tears, however, because of his commitment to justice and holiness, the judge will do what's what's right. And he values that, just as you do. 
Proverbs understands this. Proverbs 11.10 says, When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. See, God loves righteousness and there will be a time when he will celebrate the overthrow of evil, just as you want evil to be overthrown. But understand that evil first resides in our own heart. God not only delights in upholding justice, he's sort of almost astounded with the stupidity of the simple. It's like, how much could I give you? What do you want in life? I've, I give you everything in Jesus. Everything you've ever needed, and yet you foolishly persist in rejecting me. Are you kidding me? But listen, God's not laughing at you now. God is not celebrating your demise, even if you've rejected him, because you're here, he's calling you. He is in the words of Christ, Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and yet you are unwilling. If we will not turn, not only will God uphold justice, it says this, terror will strike like a storm and calamity like a wind. This is heavy stuff. What, what, what are those terrors that we're talking about? Well, the greatest terror that will strike anyone who keeps rejecting God is that they will stand before God naked and in their own self-righteousness. There will be a time coming, and that's going to be a terror beyond description. As you stand before a thrice holy God and throw your pathetic life down and say, here, this is my obedience, and your insurmountable debt lies heavy upon you, terror will strike you. This is the very terror that struck Jesus. See, it doesn't have to strike you. This is why Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane says, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me, because the terror of God's wrath was going to fall upon him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Real forsaking. Real turn in the back upon the sun. Second person in the Trinity. If Jesus was fearful, oh man, we ought to be fearful. And I'm not trying to put the fear of God into you, though I am. <laughs> but only look at Jesus and turn to him in Christ. What an what a unbelievable act of love. But there is also a perfect storm in this life that will come upon the foolish. One commentator describes it as the storm that does not come upon you when you, um, when you fail, but the storm that comes upon you when you succeed. It is the storm of coming to the end of all your dreams, all your fantasies, all your goals. You've tried, you put the goal out there, you say, if I can attain that, whether it's money, whether it's... Um, uh, um, the love of others, uh, whether it's career, you come to the end of that and guess what? Nothing's changed. You are still the same person driven by the same needs and they do not satisfy. That's a terror. That's suicidal. Because everything in your life that you've been seeking ultimately ends in a black hole. Have you ever not wondered why the rich and the, the famous are so often so sad? Because they know this. They've come to the end and say, is this all there is? Listen to, you know, Madonna? Madonna in Vogue magazine years ago, she was so honest, she said this. My drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. That is always pushing me. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. But then I do something else. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove I have become somebody. My struggle has never ended and I guess 
it never will. The storm of life that is more frightening than sorrow and hardship is when God gives you up to all that you actually want. One of the Beatles said, as a Beatle, the band, the Beatles, <laughs> as a Beatle, as a Beatle, after everything, as a Beatle, we had nothing to do. We had money, we had fame, yet there was no joy. These guys have it all. And God gives them up and says in verse 31, to the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own choices. See, we actually don't, we think that's a blessing, it's a terror. It is the terror of emptiness at the end of success, fame and fortune, there is nothing. God doesn't have to do anything extraordinary. He just has to let you go. He has to just stop striving with you. In fact, he just has to give you success in this life. And if the complacent, the simple, continue to say no to God at this point, there is silence. God finally rejects. See, up until verse 27, Lady Wisdom has been speaking directly to the complacent. Notice, it's all been you, um, the second person plural. Uh, if you turn, um, if you refuse me. But then in verse 28, it's like she no longer speaks to him or to, to the person, to, to the complacent. It says she's talking about them now. Verse 28, then they will call upon me. It's like, She's now told and then removed. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. The tables have turned. The rejecter of God now becomes desperate. They cry out, but God no longer answers. What was once a striving after is now silence. What was intimate is now distant. What was involvement has become separation. What does this mean? The rejecter of wisdom is now bearing the fruits of their own decisions and they cannot escape the consequences. All cries of regret will not reverse the circumstances. See, but more than this, there almost seems to be a, if you'll keep hardening your heart against God, as the Spirit's pressing and striving and striving and striving, God will finally harden your heart. Just like he did to Pharaoh. And there will, be a, there will be a remorse, but it'll be a remorse that leads to death, like Judas. In Jeremiah, the people of Jerusalem had blocked their ears to the cries of the prophets for, for too long, and God finally says, okay, no, then I'll, I'll remove myself. Jeremiah 2, 27 to 28. For they have turned their back to me, and not their face, but in the time of their trouble, they say, arise and save us. But where, is, where are your gods? that you made for yourself. Let them arise. If they can save you in your time of trouble, for as many as your cities are, your gods are, O Judah. Many may cry out to God in remorse, but they cannot cry out in true repentance because God has removed his spirit of striving, of conviction to save. I remember hearing a, prominent, a story of a prominent pastor who, very prominent and lived a hidden life of sin. And he finally got exposed and providence of God, within you know, weeks of that exposure, he was struck, I believe, with cancer. And even on his deathbed, there were pleads and pleads, repent, repent of your wicked ways. And it was like there was nothing there that would cause him to repent. And we know that repentance and turning ultimately is the gift of God and there was nothing there. Can you imagine that? He had preached Christ over and over again and yet spurned Christ at the same time. To be forsaken by God in any time would be difficult, but, but in the time of trouble, could you imagine it? There will be a knock. That will be the last knock and a sinner will be lost on this side of hell. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God or a living God. But then there is wisdom's promise. Wisdom's promise. Lady Wisdom closes with a summary as both a warning and a promise. Look here in verse 32 and 33. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. 
And whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Notice the contrast here. The simple turn away from Christ and block their ears. The wise listen to Christ. See, the fool is complacent. That means it's a counterfeit ease. Like those in Ukraine at that time just didn't, didn't comprehend what could, have, what could possibly happen. And there's a counterfeit ease at that. But that counterfeit ease is contrasted, it says in verse 33, with a true security, a true ease that comes to the one who fears God. The one who reverently listens to the words of God. What does it say? It's beautiful, isn't it? Whoever listens to me. And you might say, has the Spirit stopped striving with me? Like, could I be in that predicament that, I, that that pastor was? The very fact that you're here now would seem to declare to me that the Spirit's striving with you. And the call here is not, hey, just the certain group of people. It says, whoever listens to me. This is everyone. This is children. This is old. This is religious. This is irreligious. This is everyone, whoever. So now, it's like, this is the warning, but I'm opening the door just a, another time for God's people, or for non-God's people, to listen, whoever listens to me. This is a beautiful thing, isn't it? We'll dwell secure, and we'll be at ease. That's what salvation is. It's the, the finish of striving in life, without dread of disaster but you must listen you must turn and turn to Christ see Jesus now takes I think this picture here when he was walking on this earth and he declares a kind of parable listen to this uh, and I'll finish with this Matthew 7 24 everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. That's all the trials of life. All the unexpected things that will hit you and that you're fearful of. And the winds blew and beat on the house, but he did not fall. Why? Because he was founded upon the rock. That's Jesus. See, those who will listen will dwell secure, will be at ease because they're founded on the rock of Christ. And all anxiety flees because I know that I am held in my Father's hand who is holding Christ, who is holding me. I am covered in the wounds of Christ. And now I can declare to the world as all hell might break loose, I am secure. I trust him and I know where I'm going. But then it does say, verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, that's the one who just goes today and says, Pastor, that was a nice word. I appreciate that. But I have no intention of listening. We'll be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was its fall. What's the message? Believer, rest in Christ. Rest in Christ. Christ. Unbeliever, don't run from Christ. Run to Christ and find satisfaction for your soul and find the forgiveness of all your sins, what is done, what you'll do today and what you'll ever do. Let us now pray. Lord, Lord, this is a difficult word. It's a difficult word to hear. Uh, but Lord, I pray that those who hear that are outside of Christ would receive almost like a refreshing drink of water in a parched land, that they would find the forgiveness for their sins, that they would be enclosed in the love of Christ. All fear is gone, all anxieties, and heaven awaits for them. Lord, give them the confidence and the boldness to bring them to yourself, that they would call out and be saved, even now, even in their seat. And Lord, for the believer, 
May they rest at ease in the security of Christ, knowing that they are safe, that their, that their path is pleasant, and that you are walking beside them, Lord. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.